Welcome students to lecture 20, uh, the exciting and highly anticipated conclusion of MHHS 1. Um, at least I hope it's exciting and highly anticipated. Um, we'll, we'll conclude our discussion of Sage Nigel Whitson's hybrid text. Um, and again, the title of that was Super Fluid, Super Black Translations and Teachings in Trans Embodied Metaphysics. Um, and then think about what we've done in this course. Just reflect a little bit and um, reflect on where we can go from here. So last time, we imagined the various contexts of Whitson's hybrid text and how they were mining a public health past that explicitly valued some bodies um, over others. Uh, we saw this not only in the HIV AIDS crisis of the recent past in the 1980s, but also the much more distant past in the transatlantic slave trade and the outrageously cruel 1781 incident with the slaver ship Zong. I ended the last lecture by previewing some of the new fluidities and healthful embodiments that Whitson imagines in this text. This time, we'll get to how they deal with the unconcealing present and the unfolding future, um, rather than all of these sins of the past, um, the HIV AIDS crisis and the transatlantic slave trade. So this is not to say that there, these are the only two historical flashpoints that Whits Whitson references, right? In fact, um, in their description of the unconcealment of dark matter and dark energy, Whitson establishes a kind of 20th and 21st century timeline that leads up to it. Um, and we'll talk about that timeline. And after the February 2020 conference um, at Duke, where this hybrid text was first delivered, there seems to be a revised, appended timeline post-February 2020 that's included in the book chapter, the one in um, Critical Black Futures. So remember that the version we're reading was published in the 2021 book, Critical Black Futures. Um, in these creative narratives of the past, present, and future, Whitson, I think, is attempting to reveal the possibilities of healthful human embodiment beyond all of those normative prescriptions that we've clung to so desperately and sometimes even violently. Revealing possibilities of embodiment might not actually be the best way to put it. Instead of just revealing, uh, Whitson calls it uh, something stranger. Um, they call it unconcealment and explicitly references the mid 20th century German philosopher, Martin Heidegger. <clears throat> The reference is to Heidegger's grappling with um, the fundamental idea of truth in his unusual translation of the Greek aletheia. The usual German word for truth is Wahrheit, um, but Heidegger goes with a more kind of literal tra etymological translation of the Greek aletheia to arrive at the German word Unverborgenheit. All right, so if you're uh, interested, um, more in the kind of philosophical underpinnings of this understanding of truth as a kind of process of unconcealing being, uh, you, may want, you may want to take a look at the work of Mark Rathall, uh, who wrote a book-length explainer of this concept called um, Heidegger and Unconcealment, um, published back in 2010. Um, and just to note, he was actually part of the philosophy department here at UCR until 2017. Um, so since we don't really need to get too deep in the weeds with Heidegger, um, I'll just shorthand um, a lot of that kind of um, philosophical under underpinning. Um, by calling truth unconcealment, Heidegger is describing truth as something that's always unfolding dynamically rather than as static statements in the world that are marked true and false. Um, historical contextual truth becomes as important as the limited number of things that we can say are ahistorically true. So truth um, for Heidegger is always something that is unfolding, something that's always unclosing or unconcealing throughout history. So um, this, is the pro this is the approach we should take when we're reading Whitson's timelines of, quote, the dark, starting on page 170. So in 1929, the U.S. withdrew from Haiti, but left a, quote, lasting and economic dependence and enduring imperial presence. And about a year after Whitson's hybrid text was written, the president of Haiti was assassinated in July of 2021, and now the country is left without a functioning government. 
Whitson references the beginning of South African apartheid in 1930. There's a reference to the 1932 composition of Thomas Dorsey's Take My Hand, Precious Lord, um, which um, has the distinction of being uh, one of Martin Luther King Jr.'s favorite songs. Um, but also in 1932, uh, Whitson slots into the timeline the infamous Tuskegee experiment, uh, which I talked about way back in lecture one. Um, then Whitson counts 28 reported lynchings in 1933, but also in 1933, quote, dark matter made itself known. So notice that this isn't the usual history of science way of saying it. Usually we would say something like, um, in 1933, Swiss ast astrophysicist Fritz Zwicky uh, discovered a discrepancy in how much mass there should be in the universe and named that discrepancy dark matter. That's the usual history of science way of saying it. Instead, Whitson conceives of this 1933 advent of dark matter making itself known. There is a kind of creatively assigned agency to that darkness, unconcealing itself, making itself known as the unseen, unweighed matter that binds the universe. Dark matter and dark energy had already been for Whitson a powerfully evocative metaphor. So I've linked here to a video of Whitson talking about um, a 2019 performance um, of the, uh, the unarrival experiments. So from time codes 406 to 523, you can, seal, you can see what this kind of unconcealing of dark matter and dark energy look like to, to Whitson. Um, and here is the website's um, blurb about the unarrival experiments. Quote, dark matter and dark energy serve as portals to interrogating spaces of the unknown, yet they have an unequivocal impact on the composition of the universe. The unarrival experiments is an interdisciplinary performance project exploring relationships between astrophysics, cosmology, blackness, trans-embodiedness, and premature death via a notion of the vaporous body. All right, so this is why I think um, Heidegger's language of unverborgenheit, of unconcealing, is so important to Whitson when thinking about history. So when I hear something like, quote, interrogating spaces of the unknown, um, what I hear there, I immediately think of the ravages of imperial history, of stunningly violent conquests in the name of making the, um, the, the unknown, the uncivilized, um, known and civilized, uh, forcing that kind of um, knowing, um, forcing that kind of civilization under the imperial yoke. Yet Whitson's, Whitson's is not a history of the conquistador. Theirs is actually a history of unconcealing. Let's think of how this process of unconcealing continues even after that February 2020 keynote at Duke University. Notice there are references in Whitson's text past February 2020 and all the way to May 2020. Since Whitson describes this as, quote, this May moment several times on page 177, I think we can probably assume that this section was really quickly revised for the Critical Black Futures edited collection after the pandemic moment of March 2020, when everything officially ground to a stop because of COVID-19. So the main point is that history always keeps unconcealing, as we learn about um, in the very last paragraph of section three on page 175. Quote, pronouns, presences, and bathrooms only begin to unconceal what, uh, what is there of who we are. And we keep on naming ourselves to stay alive. Our beautiful diasporic community is no less a continent than the land from which we were seated. We, ha we have always been a many. Our languaging of gender in fluidities resist binaries that were never meant to hold our continents anyway. So why would we accept that somehow Colonizers got gender or sexuality right, but enslavement and genocide wrong. So the healthful body is 
liquid, it's fluid, and sometimes even vaporous, as we learned from the blurb um, from the unarrival experiments um, that I cited earlier. This kind of malleable sense of embodiment is a survival tactic. Quote, we keep on naming ourselves to stay alive. There are multiplicities, rather uh, multiplicities that need to proliferate rather than normativities that need to be policed. Interrogating spaces of the unknown, that language we hear um, earlier from the unarrival experiments, is not only the job of colonizers then, but of these new creativities that unconceal the, the, the kind of generative darkness of history. That um, final concluding question shows us how that process of unconcealing might actually work. Um, so we now say, um, according to that passage that I cited before, we now say that those colonizers were wrong about enslavement and genocide, even though uh, they thought of themselves as the good guys at the time. Um, but why do we assume then um, they were right about gender and sexuality? That's the big question that Whitson is asking. Um, what Whitson is saying there is that there's clearly more unconcealing to come. And we start to get that updated history of unconcealment on page uh, 177, when we see Whitson's May 2020 revisions. Um, as of Whitson's May moment, uh, they mentioned that COVID-19 has claimed the lives of 358,000 globally. And as of this lecture, the COVID-19 global death toll is at a whopping 6,873,477, according to the WHO. So several themes remain the same in this updated timeline. The pandemic has disproportionately affected people of color. Murders of Black and trans folks have continued. Just three days after Whitson's keynote at the Duke Conference, Ahmaud Arbery was murdered on February 23rd by racist policemen while jogging. And on May 25th, police officers murdered George Floyd during a routine arrest for a nonviolent offense. Now, as you probably know by now, Floyd's I Can't Breathe has become a rallying cry for protesters against the systemic racism and brutality of the institutions of law enforcement. So notice how in the moment this history is, how in the moment Whitson's uh, writing of this history is. It's clear that this section was revised really quickly and updated up to the minute, since, um, as you'll notice, George Floyd is actually mistakenly named George Flynn in this text. Unconcealing history is frequently dynamic and it's chaotic as this um, error really dramatizes. The mention of Tony McDade, a black transgender man, for example, was ignored by the Black Lives Matter movement, while national outcries rallied around a specifically gendered narrative around police brutality. The unconcealing of dark matter that Whitson talks about, uh, the unconcealing of dark energy, is always going to be unpredictable, errant, and fluid. I thought it would be fitting to conclude the course with a kind of creative way to think ourselves out of the binds we find ourselves in with regards to medicine. On the one hand, we should just really count ourselves lucky to live in a world with vaccines, with antibiotics, anesthetics, and treatments for all kinds of uh, formerly untreatable conditions. On the other hand, um, this shouldn't make us as Mich uh, this shouldn't make us, as Michel Foucault called it, docile bodies that give us uh, that, that that give a pass to exploitation, to harm and inequity, if it promises to make us normatively healthy. So this isn't really a trade-off we should have to make, but it frequently is. Whitson's hybrid text begins with an acupuncturist and quote energy work. So as docile bodies, we're supposed to reflexively scoff at this pseudoscience and put those quotation marks around energy work um, in boldface font. And as we learned from the pandemic, just trust the science. So that mantra of trust the science was actually uniquely useful against the proliferation of dangerous conspiracy theories, um, but it is also uniquely useless for communities that have been historically excluded or even exploited in the production of medical science. So it made sense then that um, in, during the pandemic that, that people of color were vaccine hesitant. So why should these communities trust the science when science hasn't earned it with them? Um, so just a personal story to illustrate these things. When I was in college, 
Um, I was actually one of these docile bodies who saw medical science as this kind of perfected objective discourse that really just had everyone's interest in mind as a kind of public good. Uh, we were all in this, uh, we were all kind of in my naive view, uh, in this together. And medicine was the way it was because that's the way it should be. So um, I was at Stanford University where everyone, it seemed, um, was a computer science major and everyone wanted to work for a tech industry that they thought would perfect humanity into a kind of perfect utopia of interconnected, healthy bodies. So that, um, that kind of techno-optimism was the entire vibe at Stanford. So that's why when I was um, accepted into Maxine Hong Kingston's creative writing seminar um, based off a short story I had written, um, I was initially over the moon. Um, but uh, when I got into the seminar, I was actually weirdly put off by her practice of ringing a consciousness bell for a mid-seminar meditation section, session. Um, this was just wacky pseudoscience, I thought. There was no way I could do this for an entire quarter. Um, so a big regret that I have now was that I eventually dropped that seminar because I couldn't deal with what I thought was woohoo medical science. Um, at that time, I was actually a big fan of Maxine Hong Kingston's novel, The, the Woman Warrior. Um, but I, dro I actually dropped the seminar because I thought the bell was too, just too weird. So um, fast forward to, to now, um, in my book, um, The Smallpox Report, Vaccination and the Romantic Illness Narrative, um, I think I've worked out this big college regret, regret of mine. The problem, I argue in the book, is about how we've lost the ability to read and value illness narratives beyond the strict confines of diagnosis and treatment. Um, so my problem was, I had such faith in medical institutions that I actually dropped a class that I wanted to take because I just thought meditation was too weird. So if someone said, meditation helped them. That was their illness narrative. It actually hardly mattered because we shouldn't trust them. We should trust the medical science. What's dangerous, however, is that this same situation has made it so that illness narratives have nowhere to go but rogue. Um, the situation now is that people are telling ridiculous stories about their bodies, about microchips embedded in vaccines and about the MMR jab causing autism. Measles, pertussis, and other vaccine-preventable diseases are now on the rise, even though we have perfectly effective ways to inoculate against them. There's no reason why these diseases should be coming back. These ridiculous illness narratives have zero basis in truth, yet they have gotten their persuasive power um, paradoxically from a sense of powerlessness. Um, in devaluing illness narratives, we have created a hunger for them, for people narrating their bodies into the world in strange and often dangerous ways. So um, this is the difficult and tricky path that the medical and health humanities must navigate. On the one hand, the humanities focus will point us to, um, as we've seen in this course, protest, to activism, to scenes of medicine's historical harm, speculative futures, and medicine's media cultures. On the other hand, MHHS must also ward us against the irresponsible denialism of medical science that has led to, for example, our current crises of vaccine refusal. So admittedly, this is a really, really difficult and treacherous middle path, but luckily here at UCR, we have an unusually strong collective of scholars and artists to help us navigate it. I've offered you in this course just a preview of some of these voices, and I encourage you to seek out more as you proceed through the MHHS program.